Hey guys, today we we're talking about clogged arteries, symptoms and support strategies. Very important topic because heart disease is the number one killer in Western societies. And so when we look at this concept of atherosclerosis, where we end up with plaque buildup in our arterial beds, basically this is a process of inflammation. So the internal lining of the blood vessel is called the endothelial lining. And when it becomes damaged by inflammation and oxidative stress, we end up creating scar tissue. Think about it like callus on your, on your hand. If you're using tools or something like that, you're going to get some scar tissue development and callus on your hand. And that's basically what this is. Now, normally that's going to heal if you know, we, we have less wear and tear. However, if we have repeated bouts of high levels of inflammation, oxidative stress, it's going to continue to damage the endothelial lining and continue to build up this fibrotic scar tissue that's in the blood vessel creating atherosclerosis. And of course, when we have atherosclerosis, it ends up causing more pressure within the blood vessel. This is where we get hypertension associated with, again, the thinning of these arterial beds due to plaque formation or just the tightening of the, the endothelial lining where it's, um, it loses its elasticity and its ability to flex and expand. And that can obviously cause major issues. And so major complications when we have hypertension, stroke, heart attack, kidney failure, because you really need good blood flow into your kidneys to allow them to function properly. Vision loss, because again, we need oxygen in there. Uh, those, those deep capillaries uh, to get enough oxygen into the, the sensitive tissue of the eyes, bone loss as well, because it will actually cause hypertension, cause more calcium loss in your um, urine as well. So major causes of clogged arteries, chronic inflammation, insulin resistance, our ability to manage insulin, gut dysbiosis, high toxin load, chronic stress, poor sleep, and chronic infections. So when we think about cardiovascular disease, we have to think inflammation first. I mean, this is really a, a product of inflammation. You can certainly have heart disease and be thin. However, people that are overweight, uh, they tend to have a much higher rate of heart disease. And part of that's because fat tissue itself is not inert tissue. It actually releases inflammatory cytokines like tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin-6, which cause more inflammation in the system. The more body fat we have, the higher rates of C-reactive protein, another inflammatory protein that we're going to have. Insulin. Insulin is what our body produces to get sugar out of the bloodstream and into the cells. Insulin uh, turns off fat burning. So basically it shuts down our ability to burn fat for fuel, but it also turns on inflammatory gene pathways. It activates things like nuclear factor kappa beta pathway, which is an inflammatory amplifier. It shuts down our liver detoxification pathways, increases blood pressure in the system, increases LDL cholesterol while lowering HDL and increases triglycerides which over time, when we have hyperinsulinemia, that causes the terrible triad. High LDL, low HDL, high triglycerides. It also can alter our neurotransmitters, creates rampant amounts of oxidative stress, which damage our mitochondria and our ability to produce energy within the cells. And then we'll disrupt our hormones as well. For men, they'll end up with andropause. In fact, you know, men that have belly fat oftentimes have low testosterone and higher amounts of estrogen because they produce a lot of this compound called um, aromatase, this enzyme, aromatase, which converts testosterone into estrogen. For women, hyperinsulinemia is associated with PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome, where, where the woman has higher testosterone and they end up with a lot of cysts in their ovaries. So gut dysbiosis, the gut plays a huge role in our overall level of inflammation. And just like the endothelial lining in our blood vessels, we have a lining in our gut. And when that lining in our gut becomes damaged due to inflammation, and this is oftentimes associated with um, you know, basically bad bacterial counts. So if we have pathogenic bacteria, not enough good bacteria, or we have parasites, uh, elevated levels of yeast and different things like that, we create more inflammation 
in our gut lining, which can damage and rip our gut lining and creates more inflammation throughout the body. As opposed to when we have the right bacterial balance, good amounts of bifidobacterium, for example, lactobacillus bacterium in our small intestine, acromansia mucinophilia, which is called a keystone bacteria that helps really keep inflammation down. These kinds of bacteria help produce short chain fatty acids, short chain fatty acids like butyrate, which have been shown to downregulate inflammation along the endothelial lining. So good, healthy gut bacteria is going to result in good, healthy endothelial lining and, and uh, good circulatory health. Now, toxins. We've got to watch out for toxins. One way that we're getting a lot of toxins in our body is drinking tap water. You can see in your typical tap water, you've got a whole bunch of different chemicals. Arsenic, which is commonly used pesticide, radioactive contaminants, um, other pesticides, nitrates, hormones that are in there. You know, people are are uh, flushing their their pharmaceutical medications down the uh, toilet, and that's ending up in our municipal water systems and not being filtered out if you're drinking tap water. So, you know, birth control pills and estrogen and things like that can end up in there. They're fluorinating our water, which um, can fluoride can damage parts of the brain, the thyroid. So, very very problematic. Um, lead, different heavy metals, aluminum, things like that. So we want to make sure that we are not consuming this. So getting really good filtered, high quality filtered water, like reverse osmosis or something along those lines is really helpful. Um, stress. And we all know stress plays a big role with heart disease. We're under chronic stress. That's going to cause problems with our blood sugar because when we're under stress, we release a lot of what are called glucocorticoids or hormones, stress hormones that come from our adrenal cortex that elevate blood sugar. And that's their job because when we're under stress, our body thinks we need to fight or flight. So we need to run or fight. So we need higher amounts of sugar in our blood. However, if we're just sitting like in traffic or something like that, we're not going to be able to utilize that sugar for fuel. So we're going to end up with higher sugar and then higher insulin, which promotes inflammation in the body causes a terrible triad with cholesterol, alters our sleep, our mood, our hormones, causes more pain in our body, more uh, mental brain inflammation. So a lot of different issues. So you definitely got to keep stress under control. And then biotoxins. You know, a lot of people might look healthy. They might be young. They might um, have good body fat levels, right? Lean, they have good lean body tissue. They exercise regularly, but they may have some sort of, um, they may be, have a bacterial infection that's releasing LPS or bacterial endotoxins, lipopolysaccharides from gram negative bacteria that create potent inflammation in the system. Um, H. pylori, which creates different toxins that can cause uh, more inflammation in the system. Lyme disease, these kinds of issues, mold exposure, chronic yeast, uh, chronic yeast overgrowth, vi different viral infections can cause more inflammation in the system and can absolutely cause more inflammation in the endothelial lining, leading to hypertension and high blood pressure and, and risk of clogged arteries and heart disease. So best labs to use. So what I like to look at are hemoglobin A1C levels to look at basically like a 90-day uh, look of what's happening with your blood sugar. I like to look at fasting glucose, real high, real low. I like to look at fasting insulin. So if you have a high fasting insulin, normal fasting insulin should be between two and five. I see a lot of people that are way above that, 20, 30. That's hyperinsulinemia. That's cr creating chronic inflammation in the system. Now, different inflammatory markers. I look at high sensitive, sensitivity C-reactive protein. That should always be under one. And so a lot of times we'll see that up three, four, five, right? That's a sign of chronic inflammation. LDH, this is an enzyme called lactose dehydrogenase which has to do with uh, converting lactic acid into pyruvate. And so when this is real high, it's a sign of inflammation spilling out in the system and oftentimes the indication of inflammation in the cardio, cardiovascular system, right? In the heart, for example. Serum ferritin, that is a storage form of iron. And when it's high, it's a sign of inflammation in the body. And then homocysteine, which is a metabolic a uh, byproduct of methionine metabolism, the amino acid methionine, needs to be converted into glutathione or SAMe. And if it's not, it creates inflammation in the system. And then the lipid panel, 
You know, we talked about high levels of LDL, low HDL, high triglycerides. We call that the terrible triad. It's a sign of oxidative stress in the system. Your total cholesterol in general, I'm not concerned about. I look at the ratios. The LDL to HDL should be three to one or better, like two to one, ideally. The triglyceride to HDL ratios, the amount of triglycerides to HDL, should be always under two and ideally close to one or maybe even less than one. Okay, so that's what we're looking at there. And your VLDL cholesterol, we want to keep that down under control as well. So homocysteine. So again, this is a protein. It's a highly reactive protein. And again, it should be converted into glutathione or SAMe. And there's certain compounds that are necessary for that. However, when it's not, it can cause damage to the blood vessel, all right? And that can be a major problem. You should always have levels less than 10 micromoles per meter and ideally under nine. I like to see it between six and nine, ideally. Anything over 10, though, is, def is a significant risk factor for stroke, hypertension, heart attack, Alzheimer's disease, dementia. So we definitely want to get our homocysteine levels under control. And we see this... Uh, process here. So we take in methionine, which is a very common amino acid for eating meat, um, you know, any sort of higher protein food, beans, uh, you know, so it can be plant foods as well, nuts, seeds. These things are going to have methionine. We get this in our diet and then it needs to be converted. And it is a, a, a important amino acid. It's a sulfur containing amino acid. We need to produce glutathione. That's our body's master antioxidant. And then SAMe plays a big role with neurotransmitter function. And so you can see this process is very much dependent upon folate, which is vitamin B9, vitamin B12, vitamin B2, and zinc, and trimethylglycine. So there's a lot of methylation that goes on with this. Now, normally, if we're eating a healthy diet, a good uh, diet rich in green leafy vegetables, healthy meat sources, we're going to get enough zinc, enough B6, B2, folate, B12. However, if we have a bad diet, we're eating a high-carbohydrate diet, nutrient deficient diet, and we're not producing enough stomach acid and absorbing our nutrients well, then we can very often develop deficiencies. The most common ones I see here are vitamin B12 and zinc. Very, very common people are deficient in vitamin B12, zinc. B6 is another common deficiency. Um, really all of these, B2, folate, I see these often deficient for, for uh, various individuals. So we need to make sure we're supporting these and getting those tested can be very important. Now, going back to the lipid profile. So when we look at LDL cholesterol, there are two different types. One is more cardioprotective than the other. So the small LDL, uh, which, it, which is what we call pattern B, this is a small dense LDL particle, is very dangerous. It's associated with high blood insulin. That's why I test insulin levels hyperinsulinemia or high blood insulin ends up leading to these smaller LDL cholesterol particles that have less antioxidant defense. They have less vitamin E and vitamin A. Basically, LDL is any sort of lipoprotein. LDL uh, is a lipoprotein that carries cholesterol, but it also carries fat-soluble nutrients, vitamin A, uh, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, to the cells. It also carries things like coenzyme Q10 and stuff like that to help support cell membrane health and help uh, the cell heal. So when we're under, when we have more inflammation, we need to carry more of these nutrients to help uh, defend against that. However, when we have the small particles, they have less of the antioxidants and therefore they're more prone to oxidation. They also can slip in between the endothelial cell uh, junctions, and that can cause more oxidative stress that damages, scars up the endothelial lining, as opposed to the pattern A, which are large, buoyant LDL particles. These have a lot of antioxidant protection. They're carrying a lot of vitamin E, uh, and so they're protected from oxidative stress. They very rarely oxidize, and they do their job, get nutrients, you know, key nutrients to the cell so the cell can heal. So we want the large LDL. Now, the way we know we're in pattern A, the, the healthy pattern versus pattern B, is we look at things like your fasting insulin levels. We also can look at your triglyceride to HDL ratio. If your triglyceride HDL ratio is more than two to one, so if you have you know, 150 triglycerides and 70 HDL, that's a sign you are 
producing more of the pattern B, the small dense LDL particles as opposed to the pattern A. But if your triglycerides are 70 and your HDL is 70, right? Like a one, a ratio of, of one to one, that's a sign you're in pattern A, the healthy, large, buoyant LDL particles. So let's transition to fats and talk about healthy fats. A lot of people think if you have heart disease or concerned about clogged arteries, you need to go on a low fat diet. But I, could, I couldn't disagree more. I think a high healthy fat diet with very low carbohydrates is the way to go. If you have a high fat and high carbohydrate diet, you can have problems. The high carbs are going to cause high insulin, which is going to cause more oxidative stress. So we want to get our carbs down. So I recommend a low carb diet. And then we want to get rid of vegetable oils, processed vegetable oils. It's going to be things like canola oil, soybean oil, sunflower oil, corn oil, safflower, grape seed, different forms of margarine or partially hydrogenated and hydrogenated oils, cottonseed oil, peanut oil. Avoid these things. We find them in processed foods. So avoid processed foods. You're going to avoid these. Okay. A lot of condiments might have them as well. So look for them on condiments. And instead you're looking for these fats, butter, tallow, ghee, coconut milk, coconut oil, avocado oil, olive oil, fish oil, eggs. The ones you can cook with, coconut oil, avocado oil, great oils to cook with. You can also cook with butter, ghee, or tallow. Okay, so those are your ideal cooking oils. You can put coconut milk if you want to like warm that in like a soup. That's great. Don't cook with olive oil or fish oil. Okay, olive oil is very good raw on salads, right? It preserves the antioxidants, very healthy for your body. Fish oil is good as just like a supplement form. That's where we want to use that. And then of course, eggs, you can cook eggs. Um, you know, obviously you can eat eggs the way that you normally want to eat eggs. I do recommend like, like a sunny side up style where the yolk is still a little bit runny. That's going to preserve more of the fat soluble nutrients that are in the eggs and make it more bioavailable for you. Now, other top anti-inflammatory foods to include grass fed meat. So grass fed beef, poultry, wild game, lemons, limes, and berries. Lemons and limes are very rich in vitamin C and bioflavonoids. Berries, very rich in anthocyanins. Uh, so good for the body. Things like oleic acid and raspberries, uh, really good for the body, really good for buffering oxidative stress. Avocados, rich in fat-soluble nutrients, things like potassium, healthy fats uh, to keep our blood sugar stable. Green tea, the EGCG, the epigalactic contentions that are in there, very healthy for the body. Non-starchy veggies, it's going to be things like broccoli, cauliflower, asparagus, so good for the body. We want to be consuming those Turmeric, right? One of the best herbs we can we can find. You can take supplements with this. You can also grate some and put it on your salad or juice it, different things like that. Wild caught fish, rich in omega-3 fatty acids, one of the best things for downregulating inflammation in the body. And there's also astaxanthin that's in your wild caught salmon, for example. That's very rich antioxidant, great for protecting against heart disease. Bone broth, vegetable broth, the collagen proteins that are in there, the minerals, the electrolytes, so good for the body. Apple cider vinegar, which has a positive benefit on your microbiome and helps regulate your microbiome, which helps you to reduce stress and inflammation in the body. Ginger, very powerful anti-inflammatory, very good for the digestive system, so good for the body. Organic extra virgin olive oil and olives, so healthy for your system. Be, be sure to be consuming these, um, you know, putting them on salads, on steamed vegetables, on meats, things like that. Very, very healthy for you. Fermented vegetables, sauerkraut, kimchi, pickles, loads of enzymes, good probiotics in there, um, other bioavailable compounds like vitamin U that's found when we ferment sulfur, which is very good for the immune system. Just really good stuff to be using. Coconut fats, coconut oil, coconut butter, coconut milk, coconut flakes. Those coconut fats are very good for stabilizing blood sugar and keeping inflammation down. Different herbs. I love using Mediterranean herbs like basil, oregano, thyme, rosemary, sage. These things are so good to put on meat, vegetable dishes, power packed with antioxidants. They're also called carminative herbs. They help with the production of stomach acid, bile, pancreatic enzymes. They help with moving things through the, uh, through the bowels, helping to kill off bad bacteria and regulating your microbiome. Garlic, onions, leeks, and chives, also very, very good for microbiome, for the immune system. Really good stuff. And of course, what we want to avoid, 
refined grains, whole grains, just grains in general. Get rid of those. Get rid of processed foods, deep fried foods, things like that, commercial salad dressings, all these things with bad fats and toxins in them and things that spike your blood sugar, like grains, for example, and high glycemic foods. We want to get rid of those things. Now, can we get into ketosis? I'm a huge fan of getting into ketosis. And that's because ketones produce way more energy and less oxidative stress and less metabolic waste than burning sugar for fuel. So teaching your body to become a better fat burner by going on a low carb, high healthy fat diet is important. Also adding in exercise and intermittent fasting will help your body get metabolically flexible and use ketones as a fuel source uh, more often than glucose. And that's important because again, that's going to reduce the amount of oxidative stress and inflammation in your blood vessels. So ketones and getting in a ketogenic style diet or just in ketosis in general is powerful. One way you can do that is through fasting, intermittent fasting. So you find a good fasting strategy. I tell people to start with 12 hours between your last meal and your first meal. So if you finish dinner at 7 p.m., don't eat again until 7 a.m. the next morning. And then start your day with 16 to 24 ounces of water before you even think about food. And what you'll notice is when you do that, it satiates you. It turns off your hunger and it can be easy to push your fast to 14 hours. And then from there, you may even push it to 16. And that's where the magic starts to happen. Doing a 16 hour fast, you might do it two or three times a week, non-consecutive days. We call that crescendo or cycle fasting where you know one day you do a 16 hour fast like you eat your meals between 10 and 6 the next day you might do more of a 14 hour fast and eat your meals between 8 and 6 okay and you're doing that like every other day or twice a week and that's in that fasting that crescendo to cycle fast um uh pattern then we want to try to push it into like a daily 16 to 18 hour fast and this is where i like to stay this strong fast i'm usually doing about an 18 hour fast daily Okay, and that can be really powerful for down-regulating inflammation and stimulating autophagy and allowing your body to heal itself, including damaged endothelial lining. Okay, and then you can even take it to the next level and do a warrior fast where you're eating in like a, a four-hour eating window. A lot of people will do this. So eat between 2 p.m. and 6 p.m., for example. Two meals, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. I typically am eating two meals between 1 p.m. and 7 p.m. But then what I do is twice a week, I only do one meal. So on a Wednesday, I might do lunch and then basically fast for roughly 22 to 24 hours until I eat lunch again the next day. And then I do the same on Saturday. I'll either eat lunch or um, dinner and I'll just fast from dinner, from dinner Friday to dinner Saturday. So doing that on a regular basis really turns on cellular healing, really starts to clean up any sort of scar tissue and damage in my blood vessels and allows me to be healthy, strong, and vibrantly alive. We also need to focus on good sleep. You know, you can fast and eat all the right foods, but if you're not sleeping well, you're not going to heal well. So keep your room cool. Keep your room as dark as possible. I, I enjoy using a sleep mask that really helps block out any sort of ambient light. Avoid caffeine within eight hours of sleeping. Uh, that's important to remember because a lot of people are caffeine sensitive. It's going to interfere with good sleep. Don't eat within three hours of sleeping. I try to be in bed by 10 and I'm done eating by seven. So that's always a good strategy. So that way the, the major work of digestion happens in those first three hours. And so by the time you're sleeping, your body's not having to use all this energy to digest. Instead, it can use energy to heal, repair, to produce um, anti-aging and cell reparative hormones like human growth hormone. If you eat too late at night, you're gonna suppress your growth hormone, your melatonin release, you're not going to get as good as sleep, not to get as good a healing, and you're not going to digest your food as well. Sun exposure, get regular sun exposure. You know, get out in the morning, get out early in the day. That's going to really help when it comes to your energy levels, reducing inflammation, helping you sleep better. Exercise regularly, but again, not too late at night. You don't want to overstimulate your system. Also, in the evening, you want to dim the lights. You don't want a lot of bright light on. That's going to affect blue light exposure is going to affect your melatonin release not allow you to wind down and sleep well. And then stop having goals. Wind down at 9 p.m. Stop working. No you know, major goals that you're trying to work on after nine, okay? Just be in a relaxed state. Read a book, watch a show with the lights dimmed, you know, talk with your, your partner, 
Um, do things like that. Just do, do stuff that's very relaxing. That will help you have a better sleep at night. Now, being in a state of gratitude can be one of the best things as well. Gratitude is like an, a, a powerful antidote to stress. The more time you spend giving thanks and being in a state of gratitude and, and thinking about what you're thankful for, the less your body will experience the negative effects of stress. So practice gratitude. And a couple of great tips for this, keep a daily journal of three things you're thankful for and look at that every day and, and write in there three new things each day that you're thankful for. Tell someone in your life something you appreciate, appreciate about them every day and then do your best not to complain and silence the negative. Now, getting out and moving is so important. I say, you know, you got to move 30 minutes every single day. So whether it's walking, um, dancing, right, things like that, uh, doing leisure activities, playing with your kids, great. And then three to five days a week, you want to do some sort of high intensity exercise, okay, at least twice a week where you're doing strength training or maybe like interval training where you're running sprints or cycling maybe or something like that. You want something that's going to really challenge your system because that is going to create oxygen debt. And it's also going to help you build lean body tissue and it's going to help improve your cardiorespiratory fitness, reduce inflammation in the body, help you burn fat more effectively for fuel and help produce ketones. We talked about the benefits of using ketones for fuel. It's going to help you get out of sugar burning mode, help keep your insulin down. So you're going to see a lot of benefits from that. So make sure you're doing that. We also need to make sure that we are opening up our detox pathways. So, you know, we detox through our breath, through our skin, like sweat, for example, through uh, good bowel movements. Uh, these, this is how we, how we are detoxifying. So whether you're doing like infrared sauna or sweat or a steam sauna or getting out in the heat and exercising, that sweating is going to help you detoxify. Hydrating your body really well, really prioritizing good clean water and hydrating well. So important. Um, exercise, you know, it's going to help you with the lungs, help you exhale more toxins. Also just doing deep breathing, practicing meditation, all those things can be very, very helpful as well. So good stuff. Probiotics. Probiotics have been shown in, in multitude of different studies and, and several meta-analysis to have a beneficial effect at down-regulating cardiovascular related, related inflammation or, or inflammation that affects those endothelial linings. The reason for that is they help reduce the amount of endotoxins that are released. And those endotoxins produce inflammation and then they improve the amount of short chain fatty acids that are produced by the gut and that causes down regulation and inflammation. So probiotics would be a fantastic supplement to use when it comes to improving your overall cardiovascular health and um, you know you can also do uh, fermented foods as well but taking an extra probiotic supplement has, has been shown to be, have great great benefits. Um, vitamin D so critical High blood pressure, huge connection between high blood pressure, endothelial lining inflammation, and vitamin D deficiency. So make sure your vitamin D levels are good. Ideally, they should be between uh, 50 and above, like 50 to 100 nanograms per milliliter. So you look at your tests, a lot of times your doctor will say your, your levels are good when they're over 30 nanograms per milliliter. But you might not be you know, at risk for osteoporosis or osteomalacia, bone thinning, if you're over 30. But if you're not at 50, you are definitely more at risk for inflammation throughout your body. So you want to get those vitamin D levels up. Another great supplement is long chain fatty acids, EPA and DHA, long chain omega-3s. Find these in your cold water fish and things like krill, for example. So I'm a huge fan of doing a fish oil supplement and very powerful for heart health, okay? So really, really good getting the EPA and DHA for managing and for reducing inflammation in the, cardi in the endothelial lining to support healthy arterial function. Magnesium, magnesium is very important for the elasticity of the blood vessel. So we talked about atherosclerosis, which is the plaque formation, and there's also arteriosclerosis, which is the loss of elasticity in the blood vessel, which results in the fact that the blood vessel can't expand, so we get high blood pressure. Magnesium really works on the arteriosclerosis factor. So it can also help reduce stress in the body, help you have better memory, cognitive function, uh, blood flow to all regions, less pain, things like that. So 
Um, magnesium is really, really important for somebody with clogged arteries and high blood pressure. So I would highly recommend that. And also some different things to help downregulate inflammation. Uh, supplement I use when I'm working with clients with clogged arteries and different cardiovascular issues. I like to use Inflam Defense really because it helps to break down all the different circulating cytokines and immune cells that create the damage to begin with. And so it has got things like curcumin, which is the active ingredient in turmeric. It has got uh, rosemary extract, resveratrol. It has frankincense or boswellia. It has proteolytic enzymes. So really good stuff. Quercetin is another thing in there. Really great for helping support healthy circulation and a healthy inflammatory response. And then also resveratrol power. Resveratrol and quercetin, that are the two uh, nutrients that we have in high doses in this supplement, are very, very good for downregulating oxidative stress on the endothelial lining. And very good for skin health, very good for circulation, kind of those outer linings. Resveratrol and quercetin really help. And you think about resveratrol comes from grape skin or blueberry skin. Okay, so you know, you got to eat a lot of grapes and that's got a lot of sugar, a lot of blueberries to get enough resveratrol. You could take a supplement, really has that compound. But you think about it, because it's the skin, it's also going to help our skin. It's also going to help the linings of the body. So the gut lining, the endothelial lining and the blood vessels really helps with those things. Quercetin comes from uh, like the skin of red onions and apples, for example, and elderberries and things like that. So again, really good for those endothelial linings, really good for circulating, circulation and improving oxidative stress. So yeah, when I'm working with people with these kinds of issues, I love doing high doses of resveratrol and quercetin using this resveratrol power product, as well as Inflam Defense to further downregulate inflammation, omega-3s, vitamin D, and also um, probiotics, right? We talked about all of those very important compounds, you know, very important nutrients to be taking to help improve your overall cardiovascular health, your blood pressure, your circulation, and uh, really almost every system in your body will improve. So that's a good thing. Uh, you guys can check out the links for these products and a special discount coupon that I'll have if you're interested in getting any of these in the show notes. So be sure to check that out. And guys, um, hopefully you guys enjoyed this and we'll see you on a future online training. Be blessed, everybody.